what do you do about bugs? Everybody wants to know. It's the most frequent question I've gotten since I was eight years old as a beginning gardener. Now the first thing that you've got to understand about pests in the garden is that pests are your greatest teacher. They'll teach you which plants are healthy and which ones are not because they almost always prey on the plants that are least healthy. Is it because they're stressed for water or stressed for nutrients? The soil is heating up too much. Is it because they're growing out of season? They'll teach you things, so pay attention and let them be your teacher. Now let's go back to the beginning because since that's true, the most important thing you can do to avoid pest problems is to focus on plant health. So is your soil rich? Are you providing your garden soil adequate moisture so that it's like clumping together? If it's dusty, if you can blow it like that, it's too dry. If you can squish it, it's too wet and it's going squish, 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 you're drowning your plants and they're stressed. Are you trying to grow things out of season? Lettuce, kale, things like that in the deep south, they thrive in the coolness of fall and winter and they hate June, July, and August. Are you trying to grow your tomatoes in the winter? They also, they like the warmth. They don't like the freezing temperatures. So if you're trying to grow things in the wrong season, your plants will just be stressed. Those are the plants that will invite the pests. Also, are you fertilizing with a soluble-based nitrogen fertilizers, things like miracle Grow? If you are, your plants are getting an excess of nitrogen and they literally secrete it through their pores and mama butterfly flying over top can smell that and she says, oh, I wanna lay my eggs there because excess nitrogen means amino acids are easy to manufacture. If you have amino acids, you can build proteins. If you can build proteins, you can build cell wall, which means that if there's excess nitrogen in your crops, then bugs can grow really fast and they can divide all their cells and multiply and you know, the very hungry caterpillar can grow really fast. Are you using herbicides in the area that are chelating nutrients critical for immune response in a plant? If you are, then what you're doing is you're growing weak plants that are more likely to invite the pests. So that's step one. Are you ensuring the health of your plants? What do you do about pests? Part two, beyond ensuring the general health of your individual crops, now what you wanna do is look at your garden as a whole. Are you cultivating a diverse, ecologically dynamic garden space? So for instance, do you have more than one crop. You never want to grow one crop and one crop only because it's like a all-you-can-eat wings night sign for a mama butterfly. When she's flying overhead, if there's that one crop that she eats, and just so you know, most pests tend to be crop specific. Snails prey on things like lettuces and on peppers, but they don't really do anything with tomatoes. Tomato worms eat tomatoes, you know, and such like that. So if you have one crop, a monoculture, then when mama whatever flies over and she sees your garden, she's like, oh my gosh, y'all, my babies are going to prosper. I'm gonna lay them here, right? Don't do that, okay? Another thing that you wanna do is you want to integrate things like flowers and pretty herbs. So flowers attract pollinators, but they also attract those same pollinators are often predatory insects, things like ladybugs and beneficial wasps and, um, and bees and things like that. And they, of course, help pollinate your crops, but they also do things like eat pests. So ladybugs and lacewings, they prey on, um, on aphids. Beneficial wasps, what they do is, the big ones, the ones that sting you, will sting a caterpillar, lay their eggs in it, and then they'll eat out of it like, um, like some alien movie, you know? But there are also these itty bitty beneficial wasps that you barely even see that will lay their eggs inside the eggs of caterpillars. So if you have perennial herbs in your garden, things like oregano and rosemary and thyme, what you're doing is inadvertently providing habitat to those little microscopic beneficial insects that mitigate the effects of a caterpillar because when mamba butterfly lays her eggs, instead of 200 or 500 eggs hatching, maybe only 10 or 12 hatch, right? And so right out the gate, you have less of a headache to deal with because you have this dynamic ecological system in play. One of the biggest problems that I see in terms of pest management is the fact that as a society, we are using these chemical lawn companies and they kill everything, right? That's their job. 
But the problem is, is that there's always a pest that blows in on the wind. And because we've killed everything, when they hatch, there are no natural predators. And so their numbers go crazy. So what you have to do is cultivate some habitat to reestablish some of that ecological balance. What to do about bugs? Part three. These are the five organic pest products that we use on a routine basis to manage this backyard farm as well as gardens all over the region. Diatomaceous earth is a physical deterrent. It keeps things like cutworms or to a certain extent the mothers of uh, squash vine borers from landing on your plants. Sluggo Plus is great for snails and slugs. It's a bait. They eat it. It kills them. Thuricide is the liquid version of BT and it's terrific for caterpillars. They eat it. It makes them really sick. They die. This is insect soap and neem oil. We use these in conjunction. This is kind of our last resort. If we just need to spray something and kill somebody, this is what we use. I've used this for aphids most consistently, but on occasion I've also used it for uh, baby stink bugs. And of course we have a pump sprayer in our pest bucket because it allows us to apply these last three. Say you just planted some baby lettuces and you know you've got snail pressure, then you can just scatter some diatomaceous earth around the base of the plant like that. Or say you've got some cucurbits like these cucumbers or say squash or zucchini and you want to keep the squash vine borers off of you can just throw a bunch of diatomaceous earth like that. It's kind of like crushed shells and the uh, creepy crawlies don't like to land on it or slither across and, and get up in there because it irritates them. It's like crushed glass. Lastly, let's say you had stink bugs trying to swarm your tomatoes because they like the color yellow so they get on the blooms. You can just throw diatomaceous earth at them and it gets in their joints and irritates them and they, they try to get out of there. You see all these beet leaves with holes on them? What I'm going to do is investigate and look for caterpillars. But I don't see any baby caterpillars on any of the leaves and I also don't see caterpillar poop. So my guess is it's probably snails. So I'm going to use this Sluggo Plus bait. And because I know I've got snails in the area generally, then I'm going to scatter some of this down there at the soil level. And those snails will come along and eat it and it'll kill them off. You use Thursside for caterpillars. And what you do is you mix up about a teaspoon, and I just kind of eyeball this, into oh, about a quart of water. And then you pump that bad boy up. Like this. Do that until the pressure is high. I use BT on things like brassicas, like kale and collards, but also on tomatoes. If you've got a really bad infestation of caterpillars, then what I would recommend is applying for three evenings in a row. I use neem oil and insect killing soap as kind of my last resort combo to kill all the little random things that don't have a specific pest product. And the reason I say I use it as a last resort is because there are so many beneficial insects like ladybugs and lacewings and beneficial wasps. And so I don't want to inadvertently kill off the insects that are on my team in order to take care of a pest unless it's just so egregious that I've got to knock it out. So you pour this in here like this. This neem oil is a little bit thick and the soap helps keep it suspended in solution because it breaks it up. Just follow the directions on the back of the container. But I put about a teaspoon of each per quart. And then you apply it much like you would the BT. You spray it up under there and then you can see those little aphids down in there clustering right in the center of the plant. I'm gonna be sure and get that. With neem and insect soap, you want to be sure and do this in the late afternoon or early evening. Otherwise, you'll burn up your plants because that neem oil will clog the plant pores and cook them in the hot afternoon sun. Yeah, yeah, but what do you do about bugs? Part four. These organic products can be awesome when you need them, but don't get so spray happy that you don't do obvious things like if you have a single diseased leaf, you can just prune it. Right? Or you flip this over and you see one leaf with tons of caterpillars on it, but all the other ones look fine, then you can just remove that one leaf. Or say you've got a bed full of mostly healthy, vibrant plants, but you've got one crop that seems to be attracting all the pest pressure. Maybe you just take out that one crop. One last thing to say about pest management is that you should keep your pest worries in perspective. If something's eating what you eat, then by all means, worry about it. But if something's eating or impacting parts of the plant that you don't really eat, then don't stress so much about it. Like you can see this Romanesco has a little bit of rust around the tips of the leaves, but I'm not overly worried about that because the leaves aren't my priority, even though you can't eat them. My priority is that Romanesco and it's looking fine. What do you do about bugs and other pests? Part five. 
These are eight items you likely have around your house. This is a pot. You can boil water in it and pour it on ant hills. If you have just a few ants and you want to confuse them, cinnamon messes up their pheromone trails and they'll stay out of the area. You can also use grits on a dry ant hill. They'll feed it to their queen and she'll pop. Garlic powder and pulverized red chilies can be combined in water and then strained and sprayed on your crops as a preventative because pests won't want to eat things because it tastes funny. You can also use pulverized red chilies as a dust or you can like boil hot peppers in water and spray that on your crops if squirrels are messing with them a lot. Olive oil and dish soap can be combined in a pump sprayer with some water and sprayed on things like uh, aphids in lieu of like neem oil and insect soap. And lastly, what, why do I have these marbles? People ask me what I do about squirrels and raccoons and stray cats.